So I'm talking about determinants of strain success. And I have to tell you in advance that I'm afraid I'm not going to give you any easy answers. In fact, I may not give you any answers at all, but at least I hope I'll entertain you over the next 20 minutes. The, I have to thank Nick for doing the job of introducing the pneumococcus um, to you all. The thing I want you to focus on in this slide is this, which is that the vast majority of pneumococcal infections are, take the form of asymptomatic carriage. If you think about almost all pneumococci in the world are living in the nasopharynx of somebody, probably a child, um, and they're not doing anything. They're not causing disease. Um, as Nick said, they're divided into 93 serotypes on the basis of this polysaccharide capsule, and some of these are targeted. Important thing to note, we've got a vaccine that targets seven and one that targets 13, and that leaves still you know, 80 of the best serotypes, which the vaccines do not target. So this slide just says semantics, and the reason for that is that about a week ago I thought I'm going to be giving this talk, and I thought about the title, and then I thought, hang on, I'm not really sure about exactly what any of these words mean, with the exception of of. Determinants of strain success. And I think it's quite useful to go through that in order to understand exactly the nature of the problem that we're facing. Because this is a textbook definition of strain. Subpopulations of a microbial species that can be distinguished in some small way. Well, this is not a particularly helpful definition um, because strain definitions depend on whichever small way you're using to distinguish them. Because from the talk that you just saw from Nick, how many strains are there in this tree? I mean, if you literally say that can be distinguished in some small way by sequencing, there's 240 of them. On the other hand, the way that uh, Nick introduced it, this PMAN1 lineage, they are all the same strain in inverted commas. So just to be clear, the way in which I think about strains, which is certainly going to be updated by the availability of whole genome sequencing, is using a method called multi-locker sequence typing. And several talks have referred to this, but for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'm just going to introduce it very briefly. Um, back in 1998, it wasn't really a possible to sequence a whole genome of something because you were interested in it. So this approach samples genomic diversity with a small number of genes distributed around the genome. And the idea is you take these loci, you sequence them, and you compare the sequences at them. But if you find a strain which is identical at all seven loci, that's very unlikely to have happened by chance. The way it's done in the lab is very simple. You take your bacterial DNA, you PCR up those seven genes, which are the basis for this typing scheme. You sequence them. You then determine the allelic profile, because each unique allele is given a number. And there's a database online which you can use to check your alleles and see which number um, it is. And then this combination of numbers produces the allelic profile, which defines, in turn, the sequence type. And the sequence type here is ST81, which funnily enough, is exactly the same strain, in inverted commas, that Nick was talking about, the PMN1 lineage. And the reason I'm still thinking of it in these terms is because it means that it, it's a common uh, sort of language that we can use in order to compare the results we're getting now with those that were collected before and typed by the same method. So that's strain. Success is to my mind, a more difficult concept. And I know that everybody in this room knows this, but it's still worth repeating. Success for something like the pneumococcus is not related to the ability to cause disease, or even necessarily to be resistant. And it's certainly not related to the ability to get into doctor's freezers. Because causing disease or being resistant is likely to get you into a doctor's freezer, because you're interesting. In fact, in order to truly understand the success of a strain, you have to look at a carriage sample. Because for the pneumococcus, remember, most of the time it doesn't cause disease. The most important thing is transmission to new hosts. It's not disease. It's not even being resistant. I mean, it's useful being resistant if it helps you get transmitted to new hosts. But other than that, it's not necessarily good for you at all. And the way that I tend to think of success is as evolutionary fitness, which is, I think, a reasonable way of thinking about it. But even there, you then have to deal with something which is more difficult, which is that things which are common are not necessarily common. Hang on. This is interesting. I can't even get to the next slide yet. 
There we are. Things that are common are not necessarily common because they are more fit. This is an extremely simple simulation of two strains which have identical fitness in the sense that they are identically likely to get into the next generation. And purely by chance, after, you know, I'm not quite sure how many, about 2,000 generations, this blue strain has outcompeted the white one. And at this point, you can see in the future looked pretty grim for it, but purely by chance. There is no difference in the fitness of these strains. They're equally likely to be picked into the next generation. So just because something is common, well, it is by definition successful, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it arose because it was more fit. And that's an important um, thing, which is, leads to some quite surprising results. This figure here uh, shows the rank frequency distribution of serotypes from three different locations. Incidentally, those of you who aren't into pneumococci, don't worry, I'm not going to deluge you with serotypes because of the fact, the fact is that if it's important, I'll tell you. If it's not, then I'll just keep my mouth shut. And then for that reason, I've removed all of the serotype labels from this. Instead, they are just arranged by their rank in carriage. These are the most common in carriage, and these are the least common. And you can see that this distribution looks pretty similar in three different settings, the Oxford, the UK, Tampere in Finland, and a small sample from this state in the late 90s. These are all from carriage, all from unvaccinated communities, and this distribution is entirely consistent with neutral drift. If there were no differences in fitness between serotypes, you'd get the same sort of distribution. Now, I do not mean to suggest that this means that, they were, that it is produced by drift, because there are many different processes. Um, and I know that Mark could spend probably at least two hours um, reminding me of all of them that could produce exactly this pattern through selection. But it means that we cannot say that selection is going on. But in our laboratory here, this is the laboratory, by the way, you're sitting in it. It's Massachusetts. Um, with collaborators, we have been collecting samples from, the, from carriage and children under six in communities across the state of Massachusetts since, well, you saw the one from uh, the late 90s earlier. We've also collected samples in 2001, four, seven, nine, and we just finished collecting the most recent one this year. The seven valent vaccine was introduced in 2000 and the 13 valent one was introduced in 2010. And so we've been able to track the success or otherwise of serotypes and the strains that make them up over that time period. So this is the distribution of serotypes arranged in exactly the same way, um, rank frequency, the most common, the least common, in 2004. And it reflects the impact of vaccination. The green dots represent the vaccine serotypes, which are shuffling down the distribution on their way out. And these, especially this one here, which is 19A, you've already heard the importance of that, is, are moving up and becoming more common, inheriting the, uh, inheriting the future as non-vaccine serotypes, which can completely evade the vaccine. Um, I should point out also there's no increase in the overall carriage, don't sorry, no decrease in the overall carriage rate. So this truly does reflect serotype replacement. The vaccine removed competing strains and others took their place. So now I want to just move on quickly to the rest of the talk, which is dealing with the question of determinants. While the determinants of success are pretty obvious, I mean, they are somewhere in here. This is the genome. Um, now, the difficult thing is that the variation which you observe in the genome is going to be linked to other parts of the genome. As we heard earlier, it could be you might see that something is common because, of, because it's really useful or because it's hitchhiked. You then have to take into account the fact that recombination does occur in the pneumococcus and the effects that might have. And basically, you're looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, there's 2.2 million A, C's, G's, and T's, and we have to figure out which ones matter. Um, are there differences within serotypes? Well, this is the major replacement serotype since vaccination, as I said, 19A. This is how common it was in the late 1990s. And as you can see, it's increased. And then around 2009, it looked like it had plateaued and reached a new equilibrium, perhaps. And ooh, this is what happens if you um, put something from a Mac onto a PC, the PC decides to you know, reject you. That's meant to be down there. Um, it's, you can see it's decreased 
since PCV13 was introduced because this serotype is one of the things in that vaccine. So it's been already reducing since 2010 when the vaccine was introduced last year. Again, no decrease in the overall carriage rate. And this is just a slide to show that this increase in disease has been reflected by, sorry, this increase in carriage has been reflected by an increase in disease. But I want to go within this serotype. I don't just want to say 19A has increased. What are the strains that have increased? Well, these figures I'm going to show you now are a simple way of displaying MLST data. Each dot represents a sequence type. Each line between them shows a link between closely related sequence types, things that differ at just one of those seven loci. If you're interested in how to do this, the man who developed it is sitting in the audience, and I'll be happy to point him out to you. The, um, so in 2004, you can see that this, this strain here, ST199, is top dog. It's quite common. And it may be interesting to know that it's, I've actually said here it's penicillin non-susceptible. It's no longer penicillin non-susceptible because the breakpoints were shifted. Um, so it displays lowered sensitivity to penicillin. Um, so this is the most common 19A strain in 2004, and it's still pretty common by 2007. And in fact, you can see it's thrown off a few variants. But I want you to look at these two strains here, 695 and 320, which are, have both greatly increased in frequency, but from almost nowhere. 695 was not seen before um, 2007, and 320 was very rare. Um, and by 2009, you can see that 199 is being replaced by ST320. This is by now the uh, most common 19A strain within Massachusetts carriage. And 695 has remained. Just to um, go into that in slightly more detail, these, interestingly, have been generated by the process of serotype switching, which Nick briefly alluded to. Um, look at all those STs which are lying outside this clonal complex of related strains. By their sequence types, I can tell you that this used to be found with a serotype 4 capsule. This used to be found with a 19F capsule. That used to be a 23F. Um, that, based on its genetics, you'd expect it to be a 9V, and 63 would be expected to be 15A. Now, what's interesting is that all of these, except this one, are vaccine serotypes. So they are cases of things which are targeted by the vaccine, which appear to have escaped the selective pressure of the vaccine by changing their serotype to 19A. The other thing that's interesting about them is that this, the dominant clone prior to vaccination, has been replaced by ST320, which is highly resistant to multiple antibiotic classes. It's uh, related to a strain thought to have originated in the Far East. Um, and ST695 also shows some lowered susceptibility to penicillin. Um, and as I said, both of these were previously well known with vaccine serotypes. But in fact, they've been far more successful, if you want to call it successful, by changing to 19A. Um, this, at the risk of hammering it home even more, um, shows the replacement of 199 with 320. And these are actually not only the STs themselves, but their related strains. You can see 199 has really collapsed, 320 has really increased. And interestingly, 695 has, appears to not be affected by uh, the continued success of 320. And this includes the most up-to-date data from 2011, which I finished um, looking at a preliminary version of only last week. I emphasize that this is preliminary. But also preliminary, and I only found this out on Friday, is what's been happening to the amount of the levels of resistance we observe in SD320. This just shows minimal inhibitory concentrations to amoxicillin. And you can see that this, which was the distribution of MICs in 2009, has been apparently shifted to higher resistance uh, by 2011. And similar patterns have been seen with the other related antibiotics, uh, benzyl penicillin or ceftriaxone, which suggests to me that it's true. So I want to now 
get to the point where I just ask, I mean, does this mean that resistance was a determinant of success? Well, why is ST320 successful? I mean, certainly the trend to greater resistance suggests a selective pressure, which is making it more resistant. But I have to say, if, if there were a hole in the market for a highly resistant 19A strain, why was it not highly resistant before? That's what I find difficult to understand. And another observation, which argues very strongly against such a simplistic interpretation of these data, is the fact that this other successful, or comparatively successful lineage, 695, is no more resistant than 199. But however, it apparently is not being influenced by the uh, increase in 320. And I think that this indicates, or at least illustrates something which a couple of other speakers have alluded to, which is our desperately imperfect understanding of the ecological landscape of resistance on which these things evolve. And it would be really very exciting to be able to know more about that um, and I think that there's going to have to be a great deal of work done on that in the next few years. But that means not only collecting genomic data, but collecting data on things like antibiotic use and so on. So, to summarize, uh, it's easier to tell stories than it is to test them. When we see things like resistance increasing, um, we tend to say that it must be because it's been selected or it's required for success. But it's not required for success because, as other people have noted, and Christoph is about to comment on, you find continually susceptible strains. It's not, you, not, you don't have to be resistant in order to succeed, at least in the pneumococcus. Malaria may be a different situation. And while resistance is important, um, it faces limitations in terms of spreading that we do not yet understand, to be frank. As I just said, we have to understand um, better the ecological context of inverted commas, you know, scare quotes, strain success. We need to be able to define our strains, we need to be able to define what success is, and we need to be able to link genomic variation to that success in a better way than we can at the moment. Um, as I note here, population genomics will probe this indirectly because of the fact that we have, we will have all of those however many million base pairs. But being able to take the variation we see and actually tie it to the ecological factors which have selected it is going to be more difficult. And I think there's a real challenge in terms of matching genomics to ecology. And that, I'm afraid, is going to have to be a battle for another day um, and perhaps another meeting. Now, all that remains um, for me is to acknowledge the people who have uh, been working with me on this. I'd like to especially thank John Finkelstein and Grace Lee, um, who have been, I mean, John really has been the engine behind the Massachusetts project, and he's been uh, a stellar collaborator. Mark and Abby at uh, the School of Public Health, Steve Pelton and Christoph, who's here, and people at Imperial College, and Steve Bentley, and indeed Nick Croucher, um, who you just heard. And I'd like to thank these people who have funded me or parts of this at any various times, and I'd like to thank all of you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.